The news feels overwhelming this year. The ever-expanding war in the Middle East, the upcoming election, the devastation wrought by Hurricanes Helene and Milton. It's hard to think about much of anything beyond the seemingly endless list of global afflictions that have occupied so much of our time and our heart space this year. But this is precisely what I am going to ask us to do tonight, because that is what Yom Kippur asks us to do. Yom Kippur, our annual day of introspection, compels us to turn our attention inward. This refocusing is scary, it's hard, it's countercultural even. We so seldom have the time, we so seldom give ourselves permission, but that is what we will do here together. So rather than focus on these external afflictions, I am going to invite us to look inward, to examine an affliction that is plaguing our souls, loneliness, and specifically, America's devastating loneliness epidemic. Loneliness entered the popular public discourse last year when the Surgeon General published a groundbreaking report entitled, Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. In it, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy revealed that a full half of all adults in the United States experience chronic loneliness. That's right, 50% of all American adults, including around half of the people in this room, suffer from extended periods of painful loneliness. We experience loneliness for many reasons. Some of us are lonely after moving to a new city or starting a new job. Others are lonely due to physical isolation caused by illness or disability. Some are lonely after a recent breakup or divorce. Others are lonely after a partner's death. Some feel lonely in their ongoing relationships. Still others are lonely in their battles with addiction. Some are lonely in their mental health struggles. And while loneliness is universal, many in the Jewish community experienced a different kind of loneliness post-October 7th. Some of us were lonely in our grief immediately following the initial Hamas attack. I will always remember which of my non-Jewish friends contacted me in the days following because there were so few. Others of us feel lonely because of spikes in anti-Semitism here at home. At least two people I know who are wearing a kippah or a Jewish star necklace on the subway have been spat on. But others still feel lonely in the Jewish community because of their stance on Israel. Jews who have criticized the state's actions, spoken out for innocent victims in Gaza, marched in the streets protesting for a ceasefire. Many of these Jews have been rebuffed, even rejected by their own Jewish community. Far too many of us are struggling with loneliness. I recently heard two stories from my friend Natalie, whom I met at High Holiday Services back when we were in college together, that demonstrate the profoundly universal nature of the loneliness epidemic. Natalie is in medical school, and she works as a resident tutor at our alma mater. In this role, she supports undergraduates, many of whom are struggling with loneliness. Natalie told me about one college sophomore who excelled in his classes, but who struggled finding a sense of belonging because his upbringing differed greatly from his peers. Even in a dining hall overflowing with classmates at dinner time, this student felt all alone. Natalie also spends significant time working with people experiencing homelessness. She told me about one woman she met who was experiencing homelessness and navigating opioid use disorder. Because of her addiction, this woman lost custody of her children. She was left with no one to turn to. She confided in Natalie, addiction is the opposite of community. Loneliness doesn't discriminate 
based on education or gender or age, we can all experience loneliness. The data show this too. The amount of time Americans spend together has declined dramatically. The average American now spends 20 fewer hours with friends each month. And for those aged 15 to 24, not much younger than I am, are spending even less time, the decline is even more striking. They are spending 70% less time with friends than their equivalents did in 2003. That's 90 fewer minutes each day. It turns out loneliness doesn't just feel bad. The third century rabbi Rava was onto something when he famously declared, O chavruta, O mituta, companionship or death. Some 1600 years later, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy articulated the same idea when he said, our need for human connection is like our need for food and water, essential for our survival. Doctors and scientists agree. Chronic loneliness has devastating health impacts. It increases a person's risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and even premature death. At this point, some of you might be thinking that you like to be alone. The introverts among us might prefer alone time. But there is a difference between being alone and being lonely. We all need to be alone sometimes. When we choose to be alone with a good book or movie, that time doesn't feel incomplete. It's sometimes exactly the break we need. And conversely, we can feel the most lonely, even invisible, among a big crowd, like that college student in the dining hall. Being alone isn't a problem. Chronic loneliness is. Poet Maggie Nelson describes this difference beautifully. She writes, I have been trying for some time now to find dignity in my loneliness. I have been finding this hard to do. It is easier, of course, to find dignity in one's solitude. Loneliness is solitude with a problem. It turns out this universal problem has a Jewish solution, one that begins in the Torah's very first chapter. You see, from the very beginning of Torah, we learn that God is lonely. Torah calls the first day of creation, on which God makes light and dark, Yom Echad, day one. But why doesn't the text read Yom Rishon, the first day? The other day is, say, second, third, and so on. Our rabbis teach that the Torah reads Echad, one, because God was completely alone in the universe. God was the only one there. So God begins to fill up the universe with water, vegetation, birds, cattle. This is so relatable. God tries to counteract God's loneliness by accumulating things. But as anyone who shops online when feeling blue could tell you, this doesn't really work. Even after creating all of this, God is still fixated on the plague of loneliness. From the sea to the sky, from the fish to the foliage, God describes each aspect of creation as tov, good. All that is, except one thing which is described as low tov, not good. Low tov, heyota adam levado. It is not good for a person to be lonely. It seems like God might have been speaking from personal experience here. It seems like God, like so many of us, intimately knows the pain of loneliness. Our human loneliness is a mirror image of God's loneliness. 
when we acknowledge that there is a spark of the divine even in our loneliness, perhaps we can start to find dignity in it, like Maggie Nelson suggested. But simply acknowledging this isn't enough, not for God and not for us. God goes an extra step to alleviate divine loneliness by establishing an everlasting covenant, a transcendent web of connection based on mutual responsibility and interdependence. Most of us don't hear the word covenant every day. The lawyers among us might associate covenant with loan agreements or warranties. But God, the ultimate lonely one, establishes something much more powerful than a standard contract or agreement. This covenant is an everlasting conversation that crosses generations and geography. In the Torah reading we'll hear tomorrow, God vows, I make this covenant with those who are standing here with us today before our God, and equally with all those who are not with us here today. Throughout, through the repetition of this word today, the Torah teaches that covenant extends eternally to every today to follow. Today, October 11th, 2024, we are still party to this covenant. The theologian Rabbi Eugene Borowitz taught that covenantal relationship provides a source of human meaning beyond the self. But how? Covenant means that we are inextricably bound to each other, woven together into a tapestry of mutual connection and mutual support. Covenant charges us to feel responsible for each other's well-being. When we develop this sense of interdependence, we can actualize our transcendent connection and hopefully mitigate our loneliness. But to actualize those connections, first we have to know each other. I mentioned that I met my friend Natalie at High Holiday Services. I'll confess that I don't remember what the rabbi preached about or what melodies were used, but I distinctly remember the moment that the rabbi asked us to introduce ourselves to someone we did not know. I thought it was cheesy and awkward. But I struck up a brief conversation with a girl in the row ahead of me, and she's become one of my best friends. Of all of the holy things that might happen in high holiday services, forging that connection was maybe the most sacred of all. It is a gift for which I am forever grateful. So we will take a moment now to turn to those around us in this congregation, preferably in the row ahead or behind you, to introduce ourselves. There's a good chance you'll see each other here again tomorrow. And as you introduce yourselves, you're also invited to share what brought you to this service tonight. I hope that all of these beautiful conversations can continue after services conclude. It's really very special to hear the bubbling of conversation, and hopefully this is just the beginning of some really sacred connections you make with everyone sitting around you in this congregation tonight. When our biblical ancestors first joined together in covenant, they didn't necessarily know each other they came together to become something larger by joining something larger. Like our biblical ancestors, we are a diverse group. Some of us were born into Judaism. Some of us practice Judaism regularly. Others of us only embrace Judaism on the holidays. Some are here because you love a Jewish person or you're curious what Judaism could offer you. Some of us are in the process of choosing Judaism. None of us have the same journey with Judaism or with covenant, but all of us are part of this covenantal community. Another section that we'll read from the Torah tomorrow morning demonstrates this. 
The text reads, you stand this day, all of you, before your eternal God, the heads of your tribes, your elders and officers, everyone in Israel, men, women, and children, and the strangers in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. No matter what someone does for a living, all are included in this covenant. No matter what someone's gender, all are included in this covenant. No matter when you find or choose or embrace Judaism, you are included in this covenant. Each of us has the power to discover how covenant can be ours. Some of us might live out the covenant by volunteering in our programs, supporting those coming home from prison or jail. Others of us might prefer communal prayer as a source of covenantal connection. Others still of us might enact the covenant by learning together in our Beit Midrash. I'm not here to list all of Central Synagogue's many programs. I'm here to awaken our hope. Our hope that we can develop a sense of transcendent connection with those in this room and with those not in this room. Our hope that through this sense of mutual responsibility and shared commitment, we can alleviate our loneliness. What would happen if we, like our biblical ancestors, came together into something bigger than ourselves? Imagine how we could enrich our lives and the lives of those around us. Imagine how much more connected how much less lonely we might feel. We move through many seasons in our lives, but our covenantal community endures through them all. Our lonely God still seeks connection, and we can still emulate God when we actualize this divine covenant by affirming our interdependence. 5784 was a season of deep loneliness for too many of us. May 5785 be our season of transcendent connection. <laughs>